Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the cheap underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now here's your host, David Hinojosa. Welcome to another edition of Good Books Radio. This is your host, David Hinojosa, and today I am talking with L.L. McKinney on her new book, A Blade So Black. L.L. McKinney is a writer, a poet, and an active member of the Kidlit community. She's an advocate for equality and inclusion in publishing and the creator of the hashtag What Woke Writers Hear. Ms. McKinney, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Well, first and foremost, I'd like to congratulate you on this being your very first novel. Yes, um, it's the sixth one that I've written, but it's the first one that's being published. Very rarely is the very first novel that you write, the one that gets published. So I'm happy. Okay. How, how does it feel to be an author, uh, you know, a published author? <laughs> it um, it hasn't really sunk in just yet. Okay. I, I, it still feels kind of like it felt before it happened, only I get a lot more, like, Twitter notifications. <laughs> like, that's <laughs> a really big difference. Nice, nice. Now, I saw an interview where you mentioned it took several years to publish this book. Could you share with us a little bit more about that experience? Well, yeah, um, it took about a year and a half to two years to write. And when I say write, I mean from when I conceived of it and started with, like, the very first words to when I finished it. Then I went through several rounds of edits with critique partners, and then I sent it out to query. So it took about two years to write. Uh Um, And then after writing it, it took about two years of querying to find an agent. Uh And then after finding an agent, it took about two years um, to find an editor. And then after finding an editor, which we did in 2016, it came out two years later. So it's it's been a while. um, And that's pretty much how it usually works. I know that there's a lot of Because of social media, people think that there's a lot of overnight successes. Well, no. Uh Um, It it, it, it was a lot of buildup. It was a lot of hard work. And sticking with it was key. And I'm I'm very happy that I stuck with it. Now, now what would you say are the three most challenging things about publishing this book that you went through? Oh, um, the three most challenging things is, well, my character, the main character is black, Uh um, as am I. And so we would... um, have issues where people wouldn't connect with the character. Um, mm-hmm. There have been, and I'm not the only you know, author who has had people say we have our one black girl book for the year um, or our one Asian kid book for the year. Like this is a thing that would happen. Um, it doesn't happen nearly as much now. Now folks use, you know, different language kind of coded. Um, but there, you know, people don't really know how to connect with a character that isn't like them unless Mm -hmm. they've had to do that their whole life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, running into that was an issue. Um, And that was honestly the main one. There was was nothing special outside of that about my uh, attempts to get published because every journey is different. So, Mm -hmm. you know, some people don't like the waiting. Whereas for me, I just work on the next project, you know, mm-hmm. so where I've heard some authors, like it took so long and, you know, uh, having to be, um, you know, cause publishing is very slow. I don't know why with technology. Um, <laughs> I would say the only other thing for me that was problem is that when things happen in publishing, it can't talk about it publicly until like, the signed. So I found out that my book sold in like October of 2016, but I couldn't say anything until Mm. January 2017. So keeping secrets is not easy (laughs) for me. I see. Now, what what drove you to write this book? What, what, what did, you know, what was the motivation behind it? Well, I um, love science fiction and fantasy. I grew Mm. up reading science fiction and fantasy. Those are my favorite books. I use those to escape real life. And, As much as I love those stories, still do love those stories, I never saw anyone on the cover or read about anyone who looked like me or my family or people in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I grew up, like, I started writing and I wrote books that were all about, you know, everybody in the book was white because that's what I thought 
you had to write in order to be published because that's all I read. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't until I got deeper into publishing and saw that, no, this is like a problem um, mm-hmm. that I was like, you know what? No, I'm, I'm going to write what I lacked mm-hmm. as a child uh, reading these books that I love to read, especially, you know, now that um, I have nieces and nephews who are loving science fiction and fantasy and superheroes. I don't want them to have that same representation drought and it's getting better, you know, mm-hmm. so that was my goal. Um, and, you know, for me, I wrote it for them and I also wrote it for young L who was looking for herself on those pages mm-hmm. and couldn't find herself. Now I, I, I'd like to expand on that a little bit more because I also read that you, uh, I mean, we, grew up with the Disney representation of these fairy tales. And uh, mm-hmm. you had a problem with a lot of these. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? I, I thought it was very interesting when I read that. Well, um, my thing is, it was a conversation that kind of started as a thread on Twitter where I was talking about how now publishing, um, thankfully, is looking for you know non-Western stories because for forever, you know, it was like Western mythologies and Western tales and mm-hmm. like Lord of the Rings type central type stuff, mm-hmm. which is great. But for those of us who are part of the diaspora who don't have connections to those roots, like I don't know, you know, being the descendant of slaves, I don't know the legends and the heroes of my ancestors. Mm-hmm. So the princesses and the stories that I grew up with were like the Disney stories. Mm-hmm. And for a while, in being with those Disney stories as a black girl, I was on the outside looking in and there was like this unwritten rule that you can watch, but you can't participate, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And then we finally got like Tiana, mm-hmm. which everybody in my family like lost their minds. We were so excited. <laughs> and then she spends 80 to 95% of the movie as a frog, mm-hmm. you know, it felt like a bait and switch. So there's this idea that these stories um, are, Western and can only be Western. And my beef with that is, well, those of us who were raised in, you know, the Western cultures who don't have connections to their heritage, why can't our versions of these stories be just as valid as people who do have those connections? Mm -hmm. You know, so I made a Black Alice in Wonderland and I've gotten a lot of, you know, backlash for it, um, making this character who hundreds of years old um, is out in the public domain for people to make into video games or, you know, do no one had any problems with any of the other iterations of Alice in Wonderland. Mm-hmm. Um, me making her black is, is what people are upset about. Um, and I would like to see that with other stories like, you know, black Cinderella. We got that with uh, the movie with Brandy and that's a staple in my household is that movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just helps to connect with stories that we grew up with. Those are our stories, too. And so I, I would like for A Blade So Black to, along with Princess and the Frog and uh, Brandy Cinderella, to sort of be a doorway for us to start, you know, claiming what is ours. Uh-huh. Now, I, I, and I completely agree with you uh, on that. And I also saw in an interview where you explained how representation is important. This is part of it, right? That's exactly what you're talking about, how the, these well, yeah. stories are, 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 are also ours, you know? They are. And it, it's because it's one thing to, you know, see somebody go on an adventure and mm-hmm. think that that's the coolest thing in the world. And another to see somebody who looks like you go on that adventure. Mm-hmm. And now you're like, wait a minute, you mean I can do that? Mm-hmm. You mean I can be this? Like, I just came back from going around uh, to visiting various, like, schools and libraries. And, and I'm not the only one. Like, there are other authors, like, authors who run into kids who are like, I didn't think I could do this mm-hmm. until I met you, you know, because there are so few of us who are, not only published, but in the public eye. And it's not for lack of black and other authors of color, you know, writing. Like, there are thousands of people writing. It's just the issue, like I was talking earlier with gatekeeping, where we have our one black girl book of the year, or I didn't connect with the character, or that character is not black enough. And by black enough, they mean it doesn't fit into the stereotypes that they've been fed by mass media over the years. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You know, they don't, she doesn't roll her neck or pop her gum or, you know, whatever, which those are valid depictions because those are people in my life and I sometimes do that. Yeah. But that's not the only, like, that's not how blackness is defined. You know, we're not a monolith. So now, it, it, it means a lot to see these mm-hmm. characters and also authors who are telling these stories. Absolutely. Now, uh, going back to Alice, uh, being that uh, she's black, who did you model Alice after? Alice has a lot of myself and my sisters. Mm -hmm. Um, Alice is a geek like I am. Mm -hmm. She loves Sailor Moon like I do. Mm -hmm. She (laughs) loves video games like me and my sisters do. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of things that she talks about are conversations that I've had or that I've overheard between myself and my sisters. She's, she's all of us sort of wrapped into one girl and our childhood. Um, and that's what I pulled from. So she's not, and none of my characters are based on like one person. They're a conglomerate of different people that I've met in life mm-hmm. or things that I thought were cool that, Hey, I would have liked to have done this mm-hmm. as a kid. So Alice gets to do it. Now, going back to that, you, you mentioned that she's modeled after you and your sisters. Now, how I, I read that family is very important, and they had a big part in the publishing of this book. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, my family, particularly um, my grandmother and my grandfather, were very supportive of me from the beginning. Mm -hmm. For graduation, I got a laptop. And this was back when, like, laptops were first becoming a thing, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, It was didn't have very much RAM, didn't do very much, (laughs) but it let me write. You know, it cost all the money because things that didn't do much cost all the money back then. Of course. Um, Like, they they saved up so that I could have a laptop going into college, you know. and they always made sure that I was reading and I had access to books. Like my grandmother used to tell people that I was reading at age two. I don't remember age <laughs> two. I barely remember last week sometimes. <laughs> but um, she, you know, she told this story again and again. And my mother would back it up, you know. So like reading and storytelling was important in my family. And they were supportive mm-hmm. in that Um and that's why uh, my grandmother, rest her soul, she used the dedication in mm-hmm. my first book. She wasn't here to, she was, she knew that it was soul, mm-hmm. um, but she passed away before it hit shelves. So um, I'm sorry. I feel like a part of her mm-hmm. is being shared with the world in that. Absolutely. Now, you also mentioned about a typewriter. The, who gave you the typewriter? She did. She did. <laughs> she gave me a typewriter. She gave me a typewriter, and her brother, my uncle John, also uh-huh. gave me a typewriter. Like uh-huh. I, when I, people always made sure that I had tools to do this. Uh huh. It, it was. I mean, nobody thought that it would be like a career because I mean, writing can't be a career. That's what you were taught in school, right? Uh-huh. But it was something that I was good at and I enjoyed, and so. You know, if for nothing else than to give me a hobby, they gave me things to make sure that I could do this. Absolutely. Who were your influences when you were growing up? I mean, who did you look up to as far as authors uh, when uh, you were reading fantasy? You know, who who did you look up to more? What's really funny about that is I didn't read any black fantasy authors until I started, like, late high school, college. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't run into, like, Octavia Butler and like Toni Morrison until then, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, because they just weren't taught in my schools. Like nobody, you know, we we read The Hobbit and and we read like, you know, uh, Shakespeare. We we read those guys, but no one ever was like, well, there's also these authors of color over here, you know, Mm -hmm. making waves. Like Octavia Butler was a queen. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's a shame that she didn't start getting the recognition she deserved until like more recently here. Mm-hmm. So there wasn't anybody growing up that I was like, I want to be like that author because I didn't really connect with the authors because like they were, they seemed to be in another world that was beyond me. Um, so it was more the stories. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I loved Lord of the Rings mm-hmm. and I loved the Dragonlance characters and those stories. Um, pretty much anything that had magic and dragons in it, I was all for. Um, 
So there was no author that guided me until later on in life, like I said, Tony and, and Octavia. Mm-hmm. Um, it was more wanting to escape. Now, now, what do you like about the fantasy genre as opposed to other genres? Well, what exactly lures you or, or, or drives you to, to fantasy? That anything could happen. Mm-hmm. That anything is possible. Like in A Blade of Black, a girl who loves fantasy, mm-hmm. um, loves cosplaying, you know, dressing up as these magical characters, ends up part of a magical world, you mm-hmm. know. As a kid, that would have been amazing to me. You know, I was just 15 running around minding my own business, and then, oh, wait. You mean to tell me that this is real? <laughs> so it, it's just that anything could happen, and it sort of like helped me get over things that I couldn't change in life mm-hmm. by being in a world where people, particularly kids, because I did read a lot of um, stories around teenagers as well, that mm-hmm. they could change their circumstances. Mm-hmm. So that that's some of the, one of the things that drew me to fantasy is that in things that seemed impossible, impossible things happened to change it. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, are you a big fan of Lewis Carroll? I really like the very first one. I didn't mm-hmm. really get into the second book, um, but Alice in Wonderland has been one of my favorites just because it's so weird. Mm-hmm. Um, it is. It's like a fantasy, but not. I don't know. And like, there's all these things where, like, you know, he was making fun of the times. It was a very like almost satirical writing. Mm-hmm. Well, 200 years later, it just seems like this little girl was on like an acid trip. Like that, that's what it <laughs> seems like, <laughs> you know, because um, all the context clues are lost because it's, it's a whole new era. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still like those characters are timeless, like the Mad Hatter and the Cheshire Cat. Like, they show up in non alice things. Mm-hmm. Um, like everybody knows who the Mad Hatter is, even if you've never read the book, you know, mm-hmm. um, so it's just it's one of those stories that's iconic and so strange and anything is possible. And so if ever I wrote myself into a corner and somebody was like, well, why is this this way? <laughs> Wonderland. That's why. <laughs> Perfect. That's the answer. <laughs> yes. Now, um, how did the concept of Alice meets Buffy come about? I mean, it's not a very likely pair. So how did you... <laughs> come up with this, you know, were you one day just sitting around like, I wonder what would happen if Buffy would go down the rabbit hole? <laughs> that is very close to what happened. Uh, <laughs> so I was sitting on my mom's couch. Okay. And I was watching Supernatural reruns, as one does. Uh-huh, and <laughs> they were fighting vampires in this episode. And so they were making, like, random Buffy remarks. Uh-huh. And earlier that day, I had read somewhere that Disney had announced that they were going to do a live action of... Alice in Wonderland. Mm-hmm. And my first reaction was, well, nobody asked for that. Who who wants live action Alice in Wonderland? Mm-hmm. Uh, this is like back when they were starting to redo all of their shows, live action. Mm-hmm. And so those things happened to collide in my head at that moment. It was like, live action Alice in Wonderland. Well, are they going to just remake it? Will it be new? Mm-hmm. Will it be modern? If it's modern, what does Alice look like? Mm-hmm. What is Wonderland like? Is it real? She's going to need weapons because there's some scary stuff in Wonderland. So I wrote a fight scene mm-hmm. um, because that's how I imagine Alice. You know, she goes to Wonderland, the Jabberwockies running around, you know, mm-hmm. jaws that bite and claws that catch. You need to defend yourself. So I gave her some swords mm-hmm. and then I made her fight a monster. Mm-hmm. And I liked it. So I kept going. Um, and it, it sort of just grew out of that moment of what if okay. Alice was in Wonderland fighting things like they do on Supernatural mm-hmm. because of Buffy, you know. So it, it if it hadn't been for, I guess, like everything you're sort of meeting in that moment, it might not have happened. Mm, I see. Now, who who's your inspiration for Hatta? That is sort of like a, a take on a bunch of different characters from like video games and um, movies and shows that I like, there's always like the mentor, the person who is sort of like the gateway into for the, the character into the new world, it explains all the things. Mm-hmm. Well, usually it's an old guy mm-hmm. um, who's, you know, an expert, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, what if he's younger? And mm-hmm. what if 
he doesn't necessarily explain everything because mm-hmm. it's on a need to know basis mm-hmm. or because he doesn't want to because his past is not the best and so he doesn't want to talk about it mm-hmm. you know um there was a war in wonderland and he fought in that war and as a result he has you know uh ptsd so he like doesn't go back there mentally because mm-hmm. it's not good for him of course um so i just there, there was no one person. It was just me wanting to flip the trope of the guardian slash mentor on its head. I see. Now, are, are characters in Wonderland immortal to a certain extent? Because I remember reading that Hatta had was what six hundred and one years old or something along those lines. So he was an old. Yes. Yeah, he was an old, <laughs> very old uh, person. <laughs> the way that it works is um, in Wonderland, time is different. Mm-hmm. So if you're in Wonderland for like two weeks, maybe it's one day here. Maybe mm-hmm. it's one hour here. There's no telling, which is why um had to explain to Alice, when you go to Wonderland, do your job come home? Mm-hmm. Because if you're there for, you could be in Wonderland and a month might pass, but out here it's been like a decade, you know, mm-hmm. so you don't want that to happen. So he's old in the sense that, He's been around for a lot of human years, Mm -hmm. but not too many, like, Wonderland years, you know. And so time is relative because they don't have, like, they don't have a sun in Wonderland because there's no planet. So there's no, you know, Mm -hmm. going around to mark the seasons. So the only concept of years is from humanity. Mm -hmm. Um, So when she says, like, yeah, he's this many years old, well, yeah, that just means he's existed in our, I you know, realm of understanding of for a hundred years, um, but he's actually like twenty-one. You know, <laughs> if you were to put him somewhere, um, probably. Um, so he's immortal in that sense. Mm. Like, if he stays in the human world, he'll grow old and die. Of course. Um, but um, you know, they can also be killed. Yeah. By. Of weapons or so forth so they're, they're immortal it's it's funny because wonderland of course that's exactly that's the answer because wonderland that's, that's it, it. <laughs> because wonderland so i i wanted to make it so that you know because they are based on dreams and concepts and human subconsciousness so that never fades mm-hmm. um it only either gets stronger or weaker or you know tainted or it just morphs um so that that was my basis for them. So they're immortal, as in they've been around for a while, but only as time is relative. Because they're kind of timeless in Wonderland. And I I thought that was very interesting to to read uh, because I you know I never thought about them being immortal to a certain extent. Uh, um, another thing that I noticed in your book, uh, I'm, I'm going to fast forward a little bit on this, but there's a very strong female representation throughout the book. As a matter of fact, I. I notice that male characters are almost just there for support. Even Haddis, which is one of the main characters, he does he lets Alice do her thing a lot. So uh, I thought it was very interesting. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, about about that? Well, yeah, there's this um, there was this push for strong female characters mm-hmm. in young adult literature, mm-hmm. and that push wound up being strong as in how it relates to male strength Mm -hmm. so it would be a girl with a sword or a girl who can fight you know um which i guess that's the technical definition of strength and then i can lift 150 pounds or whatever Mm -hmm. um but you know i wanted to get at that there's different kinds of strength like yes alice is stronger and faster than your average you know human being Mm -hmm. But she still gets her butt kicked quite often, you Absolutely, know. Yes. But it's her willingness to get back up. It's her willingness to keep doing it. It's her willingness to like put herself in the situation to help people, you know, um, to take charge when she needs to take charge. That kind of strength is what I wanted to put on display. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, she's very resilient. I mean, throughout the book, she just keeps trying and she keeps. She doesn't let her self get beat up easily yes so that i wanted i wanted those characters alice and the other uh 
women in the book Mm -hmm. to sort of stand on their own and for the guys to be there but they're not there to save the day they're there because they're part of the team you know it's it's not we're the heroes and we're going to solve things it's like well no you're going to play your part because everyone has a part to play Mm -hmm. i thought that was very very interesting i I really enjoyed reading that aspect of the book uh, that you had all these uh female characters and those were the the strengths lied within them not necessarily in the male roles mm-hmm. um uh, another thing i really enjoyed about the book th- there was these two characters maddie and the black knight were just a, a thrill to read about <laughs> i loved them i don't know why i identified so much with both of them um maddie's uh, just funny and so is the black knight but just in a different way could you tell us a little bit about how you came about this concept for or the characters themselves. Yeah. Um, and Maddie is turning out like a fan favorite, I'm yes. finding. Um, <laughs> well, Hatta, the Mad Hatter, um, doesn't do anything on his own in the story. He's usually accompanied by like the March Hare or the Dormouse. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, okay, well, he owns the bar and he's busy training people. Somebody needs to like, make drinks if this is going to be believable Mm -hmm. so we need a bartender well nobody's going to be able to work there without knowing what's actually going on so it's another person from wonderland Mm -hmm. so i came up with maddie and i was like well what if she doesn't more than drinks what if she mixes potions Mm -hmm. and so it's like okay well she mixes drinks and she mixes potions well she mostly mixes potions in sleep she she does the drink thing kind of like as a side hustle almost (laughs) yeah um and there was just honestly a lot of things that went into her were things that I thought, wouldn't it be cool if, yeah. like, you know, her eyes changing color whenever she blinks. Yes, I, I, I love I that. I just thought that would be awesome. Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> and now I have to figure out what the reason is behind it. Oh, Wonderland, that, that, that's the reason. <laughs> of course, it. Wonderland's always the reason. <laughs> um, And the Black Knight, like, he wasn't even, I was almost two-thirds of the way through the book and he didn't even exist. Um, Mm -hmm. when I was first writing it, because the Black Queen was going to be my antagonist. I had this whole thing planned with the Black Queen and her rising and bothering Alice, but it wasn't coming together. And I was talking to another author friend who was like, you you need to figure that out. If you don't know what your, you know, your villain wants, then you don't know why your your good guy is fighting them. Um, And so one day I was writing this scene where Alice is going home after a mission and, you know, this sort of sly, uh, witty guy just shows up, you know, to antagonize her. And I was like, oh, so that's who that is. He's mm-hmm. here for the Black Queen and the Black Queen is off doing whatever she's doing. Okay, there we go. And I wanted my villain to be likable because okay. when your villain is likable, you don't know who to root for when they're facing against you know, your hero, Mm -hmm. um, which kind of causes these conflicting emotions inside. Um, So it was was on purpose that I made it like, you know, rooting for one means rooting against somebody else that you kind of like, which is, in my opinion, some of the best storytelling out there. Mm -hmm. Um, And so he came about as sort of this foil to Alice where she is sort of, you know, doubting herself. He's full of confidence, so much confidence. He's even confident in her, Mm -hmm. you know, And where she feels like an awkward duck, you know, he says something funny, like every other sentence, you know, so he's he's just sort of the opposite of her. Um, And it almost seems like, you know, where she feels in strength and combat, he's better. But then we notice that that sort of switches a little bit as we go along Mm -hmm. um, because it's all in, you know, her head. Um, So it's I really enjoyed writing him as sort of like, the opposite of Alice, but at the same time embodying everything that she kind of wants to Mm -hmm. be um, as a person and as a dreamwalker. So both Maddie and him were were fun to to not only put on the page, but then add little things in as we went along. I see. Well, uh, I I really enjoyed the book. I thought it was an amazing read. Uh, Is there anything you'd like to add before we, uh, unfortunately, we have to end the interview, but uh, is there anything you would like to to add to this um well it a blade so black is the first in a series mm-hmm. uh so there will be more and hopefully here in the next uh couple of months we'll be releasing information about book two so 
just keep an eye on all my social media for that. Looking forward to it. Ms. McKinney, thank you so much for talking with me today. Thank you for having me. This was a blast. Oh, thank you. Uh, like, uh, I've been talking with L.L. McKinney in her new book, A Blade So Black. It is an action-packed novel uh, of Alice in Wonderland as you've never experienced her before. I highly recommend it. It'll make a great holiday gift to those fans of the fantasy genre. I'd also like to remind our listeners that aside from our regular broadcast, you can also access this and our many other interviews with the Books Radio, Strong and Cook. This is your host, David Hinojosa. Thank you for listening. <laughs>